Thanks for joining me today for Think Big with Michael Zellner, powered by Platinum Jewelers. My guest today on episode 110 is Stephanie Anduhar. Stephanie, whose nickname is Steph A, is a, an actress, a director, a writer, a producer. She's also a singer, dancer, and a songwriter. She grew up in Manhattan, New York, and ended up getting discovered when she was really young, about 12, 13 years old. She got accepted to talented Talent Unlimited High School, and she performed in more than 10 dramas while she was there. Uh, she received her business degree from Pace University in New York in 2009. Mm -hmm. And Stephanie and her family started Anduhar Productions in 2018. And since then, she has produced and starred in a comedy sketch series, Steph A One Woman Show. And I highly recommend going on YouTube and watching it because it is freaking hilarious and she's very, very talented. So you got to definitely check it out. Stephanie, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Michael. That was such a great intro. It, sound <laughs> it sounded like one of those um, like old dating shows back in the day where yeah. it's like they're breaking down the bio yes. of the single person. <laughs> right. They're trying to make the person sound a little bit better than they are. But in this case, exactly. here, everything I said was absolutely And you did a true. great job. That was really good. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So, Stephanie, you've done a lot of work on, on television, movies, mm. and theater work so far in your young life. What are a few of your hobbies uh, that you do and enjoy doing when you're not performing? Oh, my goodness. Well, okay. So, far as hobbies go, I would say I do a lot of sewing, and I'm pretty sure maybe you've seen some of my garments that I make yes. and I present on Instagram. <laughs> yes, I've seen those. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I actually have been sewing since I think like 2015. My mother happened to acquire my grandmother's sewing machine that she wasn't using anymore. So I said, I'm going to figure this out. I asked my sister for some tips, my older sister. She's like two years older because uh, she went to fashion design school. So I was like, let me ask her some tips. She gave me some tips, whatever. And then she said, OK, now throw you back to the wolves. You figure it out. I said, OK. <laughs> And then that's when I figured I have it in my blood because like my grandmothers have done it on my father's side, my right. mother's side. You know, I just in that Puerto Rican blood, you know what I'm saying, I guess. So I just started. And of course, looked at some YouTube videos, tutorials and figured it out from there. But I like making I think I just like making my own clothes, too, because it's like it's a therapeutic thing away from all the industry hustle and bustle. Right. <laughs> that, I may have to be put up with, you know, but um, I think that that's what I found enjoyable about sewing. Like, I don't just make these pretty outfits or, you know, kind of fun costumes just to make them, which is cool. But it's really fun. Like when I made um, my Catwoman outfit for Halloween based off of Tim Burton's Catwoman for Michelle Pfeiffer. And because that one was hot, that was like a sexy right. outfit. So I was like, I'm going to do that one. I spent like a month and a half nearly making that costume. And when Halloween was over, I, I can't lie. I kind of was like, you know, it was like that postpartum of like right. moving on from a because it becomes like your baby as you're because you're an artist, you know. So when you create something, you know, you have to set it out and then you'll be done with it eventually. But you get that bittersweet. <laughs> what is it? Parting is such sweet sorrow. Feeling. Right. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you talk about YouTube and, and you learned a lot from there because and so mm -hmm. when I ask some of my friends how to do some stuff sometimes that I'm not I don't know how to do, they always go, dude. It's on YouTube. <laughs> just just type it in. Anything you want to know is on YouTube. You can learn it right there. And it's true. Yeah, yeah, it's true. You get like a little, I feel like they give you some training ground. And then right. now you got to kind of now do it on your own too. Yeah. So that's what people think. Like you can just go to YouTube. It's like, yeah, I can. Now I'm going to spend some time because then now I got to pause and go back. Exactly. And get, you know, go that's through exactly it again. exactly what happened to me. <laughs> yeah, it was like and a part. you're there for like hours, you know. <laughs> so I was trying to put a part in and put in my Hummer H2 for like an air conditioning part that was on the inside and it was oh. on YouTube, but I was just like, uh, after an hour, I was like, forget this. It's worth paying. Wait, you say a Hummer, you, like you, your car is a Hummer. I have a 2005 Hummer H2. A Hummer H2. That uh, sounds massive. It, when I bought, <laughs> when I bought that car in 2005, gas mm. was a dollar 69 a gallon and it and never been over $2. Holy man. I know. And so it went up to four, when it went up to four hours, like in the late two thousands, I was like, uh, I'm glad I kept my Ultima. So I drove that part of the time. <laughs> yeah. But I still right, have it. I, I still love imagine. it. It still looks wow. brand new when it's clean. It still looks brand new. I've taken good care of it. So I bet all the other cars in the road get scared of the Hummer, right? When it comes through. 
I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would think so. I see a Hummer next to me. Okay, I'm moving till we're here. <laughs> yeah, but it's been it's been a fun automobile to have. That's cool. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, your acting career started early in life. You know, your mom and dad enrolled you in uh, Beacon After School Arts Program. You know, tell That's us right. a little bit about that. And were you excited about doing this at such a young age? I was. You know, the thing was, is that I grew up in uh, 415, which is the the projects out here in Chelsea. And it was a pretty tough time during it. It was about, I would say, like 97, 98 and the thing was, is that my pops, God bless his soul, he was a real tough OG out here and he ended up doing some time upstate. So while he was away, my mother was like, you're not going to stay out here, you girls, you know what I mean? And my little brother, you guys are going to do something. So it, I think I just came across a flyer. I gave it to my mom because you know how back in school they would give you things. Teachers would give you like flyers and things and you had to always show it to your parents. You know what I mean? So then she was just like, you're going to do this. And you're gonna, it wasn't a thought of you're going to do this to become this great Stefa the actress, you know, you're not, that's not what this is about. It was more really to keep me off the streets. And since my father wasn't really around at the time, he too was like, make sure the girls are taken care of, that they're all right, that they stay busy in the right environment, you know? So that's why I guess my talent was really born out of a, a necessity too. You know, I was going through right. a lot, you know, my father was upstate, my, me and my siblings now had to kind of like take care of ourselves and our mother was doing her best. So, you know, it was a time where it was like, I found my calling, but I found it kind of at the right time, which right. is, I'm just discovering that now I'm having an epiphany moment on the Michael Zellner show. So this is fun. <laughs> well, that's good. That's cool. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize. I think I said Steph A. It's Steph. It's Steph A. Well, you know, yeah. It, the thing is that my father, that the backstory is my father used to call me Steph A when I was okay. much younger. My father was born in Ponce, Puerto Rico. So that's my background, Puerto Rican. And he would call me Steph A short for Stephanie. So he'd be like, Steph A, ven aquí. Come here. Steph A, Steph A. So as I started getting into the more in depth of the industry, uh, Stephanie Andohar realized Steph A, if I make the A big, that's also the A from the letter of my last name. So I was like, right. oh, that's kind of a cool, like a play on my Stefa of what my dad would call me. <laughs> right. So it's fine. You said Steph, hey, Stefa, it doesn't matter. You okay, just say. making sure. <laughs> so, you know, just a year later after, you know, in, in the beacon, you were performing as the Scarecrow in the musical, The Wiz, you know, you were discovered by a talent manager. Uh, what was that like, uh, you know, for you at just 13 years old to be discovered by somebody? She thought I was a teacher. <laughs> really? <laughs> I was 13 years old and she thought I was a teacher because I was doing, I guess, cause I was putting my all into it. You know, I loved dancing and I really started finding myself as a bit of a little entertainer when I started working and, you know, performing with Beacon and the suit I had on, there was straw sewn to the suit. I was wearing like a plaid wool sweater underneath jumpers, overalls. There was straw sewn in the hat. It was about a thousand degrees under that little outfit. Thank God I was 13 years old and I can handle that, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah. But I was backstage fans on me when I would have my moments of breaking. But it just so happened that she happened to have a client that also was in that play. She was playing Dorothy. So then when she saw me as the scarecrow, she was like, oh, who's that? that that's a teacher. Oh, my God. And they're like, no, that's a student. And she was like, oh, even better. That's good. <laughs> yeah. She's got some time. And I'm like, <laughs> So then I started, but I didn't really start booking work uh, professionally until I was about, I would say like over 18, 19 is when the professional now that when the industry came in right. before that, it was just theater. And that led me after the after school program that led me now to talent unlimited. So while the manager discovered me, it was kind of like being like going through, I don't want to say grooming because that just sounds like you're being groomed for the industry, of course. Like, right. <laughs> But I guess you can say you can say I was already learning. She was giving me tidbits of like what to expect now as you go into the industry, work on headshots. And while you're learning this, you'll be in your, you know, you're in high school doing your plays and things like that. I was like, OK, yeah, that's cool. So then after that, I came out of Talent Unlimited High School and then went to Pace University because I thought I'm going to go into business now. I'm not going to like I don't know if I'm going to become this actress. I, I wasn't sure. 
but it seemed like it's just like Al Pacino and the Godfather. And he was like, just when I'm trying to get out, they pull me back in, you know, right. <laughs> so, so I'm movie. trying to get my, yeah. Literally. When I'm trying to you now get my business degree to be like this, you know, maybe this business girl, I don't know. And that's when law and order. Now my manager who did discover me at that time, she got me a job on law and order SVU, my first job. That's what story. Did- <laughs> yeah, that definitely. That's that very fast forward. And you're right. Most of the stuff, a lot of stuff, you know, you learning during those younger years and it got you prepared. So when you're 18 or 19, yeah. you're ready to go. Right. What, exactly. What influence did uh, Derek Ties have on your life? Oh, Derek Ties. God bless you, Michael, for mentioning his name. That was so nice of you. I'm glad you mentioned it because he was my drama teacher in the Beacon program. He was the like the the, the artistic coordinator there. And he pretty much knew my potential. Like he just knew, like he, there were days where he would just crack the whip on me, like, you know, and I would be like, why is he picking on me? I don't understand. And then later on he would tell me stuff. It's because I know you have such great potential. I know that you can be the star that I see you can be. And he taught me how to perform a monologue because before that I had no idea what a monologue was. So him and a couple of other teachers that were really cool in the program were working with us. You know, we were kids that grew up in the projects for Pete's sake. I'm not going home performing soliloquies from Shakespeare, (laughs) you know, know, going through what me and my family are going through. So that's why the Beacon program, it was important that something like that existed at the time that I needed it most. And it was educational at the same time because it was preparing me. Okay, this is a monologue. You're going to need this now to audition in the future, even for school and for auditions. So this, you need monologues in your back pockets, you know? So Derek Ties prepared me for the school that he went to as well, because he attended Talent Unlimited. So it was funny that it was like full circle, like, oh my God, now I'm teaching her and she gets to go. And, but he passed like, uh, he passed a while ago, but it was kind of a shock when it did happen because we were gonna start working now on, you know, um, introducing some of their kids, you know, like different things that he wanted to introduce to them regarding the arts and things. And that was really like a moment like, oh man, I miss him. But he was mad important. And I'm glad you brought him up for real. (laughs) It's amazing having people like that, that believe in you at a young age and what influence and what effect that has on you. People just don't, sometimes they don't understand that makes all the difference. Exactly. Exactly. It makes all the difference. You need to believe in yourself. Like that is the number one thing. I wish I could show you on my wall. It says, believe in yourself right next to me. I painted that on there with my little brother and I look at it all the time. I, cause you have to, it starts with you. And then now if you have that support around you, it just makes what you do more enjoyable. You know what I mean? Like right. I, I don't always do this for myself. I, I always do this And I stay in this business as long as I can because of my fans and the audience. I perform for you guys. You know what I mean? Like I do my dancing and everything else and my singing and to keep my fans excited too for what I am doing and what I can do. And I express myself that way too, because I am an artist. So that's cool. (laughs) That's wonderful. But it's not important, man. Thank you. (laughs) And you just mentioned a minute ago, you know, 2007, you're just 20 or 21 years old and you're in college at Pace University. You find yourself auditioning for one of the top shows on network television, Law and Order Special Victims Unit. And you got the role of playing a character named Latrice uh, Munez. And you had a scene with Ice-T, who plays mm-hmm. Detective Odafin Tutuola. Yeah. I, lo- I love Ice-T, and I love that character. That show's <laughs> just Jeez. amazing. 23, 24 years now. Mm-hmm. And uh, you said to him, quote, look at you throwing gang, Poppy, like you know your thing. <laughs> And then he said to you, quote, little girl, I was through with it before you knew what to do with it. To do with it. That's right. How did did you end up getting that role? And were you nervous working with, you know, such big stars that early? Yeah, man. Like, so the manager that had discovered me at that time, she submitted me for, it was, it was, I guess the roles out there in the breakdowns and Jonathan Strauss casting cast as Law and Order. And it's funny because I live in like the same neighborhood that they cast and everything. And I remember it was like, she's a prostitute and she's pregnant. <laughs> I was like, okay, right. that sounds kind of 
easy, I guess. I don't know. So I ended up putting clothes in my undershirt, put, you know, to make a fake belly, kind of wore like, you know, the boots and the skirt. Yeah. You know, my manager was like, just try to make yourself look as convincing as a character as you can, because we know that that's not you, but you got it. You're an actress. I'm like, okay. I'll do it because I I was actually I went through auditions auditions just like auditions before this one right it was like a gamut of them and I remember I was just already kind of feeling a little defeated because I was kind of like I'm gonna do this again and now I'm gonna dress up because before I wasn't really doing that I'm just like look at my talent I have all this talent you'll see it through the character but sometimes people need a visual and sometimes too when you do dress as a character for me personally I just become that that character. So I walk in there and I remember actually I rehearsed with my brother. Oh, that's like a notification on my phone, my bad. I rehearsed with my brother. He was only like 12 and I had him read the lines to me. I was like, brother, I need you to read these lines. <laughs> he was like, okay. And I was like, okay, and then, okay, I'm gonna go. So I went in there and I remember the producers are like, are you really pregnant? And I was like, if I was pregnant, I really wouldn't be here. Maybe I would be because I would need the money, need the job, right. but, <laughs> but no. <laughs> so that was a good sign already. I was like, yeah. oh, very right. believable yeah man so then i went through the lines went through the scene and then i found out that same evening because you know tv cast is pretty fast and i was like all right like let's go i was i was really nervous but then it it hit me when now working on set you know this isn't the same as like you know your little high school theater this yeah. isn't the same as like local theater this this is the the big leagues you know and you kind of just have to get in there. Whatever I know, I know, and that's it. But I remember Ice-T was cool because I was a little nervous in, in one of the scenes where we're looking at the monitors. And I was like, and I was like, oh, am I doing great? He was like, you're doing great. Like, you know, in that Ice-T way. Yeah, I can hear that voice. <laughs> and his wife, too, was on set. She looked really beautiful. She was really like, cause you, she was in that episode, uh, the, the oh, episode really? I was cool. in. She, yeah, she, I think had a guest star moment as well. And she was like, oh, that, that's like the, the power couple duo right there. Like that, that's pretty cool. So it was all pretty like, you know, it was exciting and they were really nice. Like the, the cast members too were very, very, you know, they were easy on me because I was new, you know what I mean? And I remember the director too of that episode, he was like, I didn't realize it was your first job. I'm glad, you know, I gave you your, your first job. I was like, thank you. Right. That's <laughs> awesome. You know, a lot of people don't realize that actors and actresses, it's more than just one audition. You get the role. I mean, sometimes it's three, four or five auditions. I have one of my good lifelong friends who's an actor. He's never done anything huge, but he's done a lot of stuff. He was on an episode of Blue Bloods uh, last mm -hmm. year in the final episode. And and he uh, did, I remember when he did NCIS New Orleans, he went through five auditions to finally get. And it was a big part with Scott Bakula that he was in with. But five auditions, and, and a lot of people mm -hmm. don't understand that. You know, they think, oh, they just do one and they get it. It's not that way, is you it? You see? No, it's not, Michael. You know this already. <laughs> you already kind of know. So I'm glad you're bringing it up so the listeners and the viewers can, um, can understand that this is why you prep, you know, as an actor, artist, whatever it is in your field, any field, like just like you, right, you prepped for coming now onto our our convo here right. that that's what makes you professional and ready to go for the part when i auditioned you know for orange is the new black it was it was already i think like four or five auditions before young rosa it was a it was a while and right. but that's also too the test of a really good actor a really good artist because you know what man if if people could you know like i remember when the pandemic hit this is to go with what i'm saying I remember going past the, the churches, seeing the food lines, and I'm like, if people could wait on there for hours, what's wrong with waiting in a casting member's office for two hours, wow. for three hours? That's what's reality. wrong with that? That's reality. For real. I'm, 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 you know, because here we are getting an opportunity. It's not about just booking the job. I'm glad that where I'm going is indoors. I can go do my thing and I'm getting, I'm, I have an opportunity for a job. Or you know what I mean? Because I'm yeah. bringing, well, how can I help? It's not about I'm going to be now, you know, this and this and that from this. It's more about how can I help? And it's the truth. I remember waiting in offices for hours on end. And it's not, a, you know, it can be seen as like, oh, this is a power play or this is, you know, what's going on. It can be, but 
I'm like, you know what? Like I said, if I see these lines and I've seen it, you know what I mean? Being here in New York too, and it wasn't easy for anyone. And I said, I'm just really grateful. I'm grateful I'm getting an opportunity to be seen however many hours it takes. <laughs> I don't care. As long as I'm here, I'm in the door and I'm ready to shine and show you what I got. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, one of your uh, biggest breakout roles came in 2009 uh, Academy Award winning movie, uh, Precious, which did you know really well at the box office, it cleared over $63 million. Film was nominated for the Best Ensemble at the 8th Washington, D.C., Film Critics Association Awards. It won the award mm -hmm. for the best cast at the 30th Boston Society Film Critic Awards. You played the role of, you know, a former heroin addict, uh, Rita Romero. Um, mm -hmm. share, well, if share with us a little bit about, you know, playing that character and, and how, if all, do you prepare differently for a role like that? Yeah, I was, I was, man, I was really, I was excited, but it was also overwhelming because like you said it was a pretty heavy role yeah. and you know I, you know I don't want I don't want to get too personal but I have had you know I it, I've, it was I've seen it kind of within family and 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 you know being around the neighborhood and stuff like that you know what I'm saying like it's it's that's not a good thing and but I remember I tried my best to like in, in capsule what I knew about that kind of thing. Like that's the worst drug anyone could ever do, yeah. you know? And, you know, I love my pops and everything. And it's just the true, like that drug is the worst drug ever. And if I could encourage anyone, like this is a little disclaimer before I talk about the character, I guess I'm just saying like, stay away from that. Do, you know, if you want to do, uh, you know, the bud that's fine <laughs> right. you want something like that that's fine but when you go to that drug now you know and that's why i guess it was just odd that and then I, I got to play this character because it seemed like since like i said these roles and everything i've ever gotten in my life starting from i was 13 to there these roles seem to have come at a time when something in my family or something was going on in my life that now i can go and kind of explore that and express that through this kind of character. So I remember I had to hand deliver my headshot to casting at the time. It wasn't just like email and like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. they wanted the headshot. I delivered it, went back to the callback, went back now for the, like the second, third callback in the rain, drenched. And I remember me and like a bunch of the actors were all drenched waiting in that casting room. We were all just soaked. And I went up in there. Lee Daniels liked my audition. He was really thrilled with it. But it was like still nerve wracking because, you know, he could have been thrilled with it. But then somebody else could have like knocked him off his feet. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. it was kind of like, do I have this part? And I remember too, my father was trying to give me tips like of how to play the character, how to play the role, because my father knew people like that and everything. And he was trying to, and I think too, I was a bit stubborn, like, dad, I know what I'm doing. I know what I got, you know, I got this. And it's like, what does a 21 year old know about playing a former heroin addict? You know what I'm saying? Like, this is tough, this is tough stuff. And I remember the Lee Daniels, the director did a great job of like, you know, trying to get those moments that I could provide for the character. And I read her book, you know, her background in the book, The Push by Sapphire. And, you know, it was funny so that she was Puerto Rican light skin just like myself because it's like funny how people think you're puerto rican they automatically think you're either you know you're brown skin or you're just you know something about color it's like but that doesn't matter i'm boricua it's in my blood and i love it and i'm proud but it shouldn't you know what i mean like it doesn't matter the the, the color that you are and it just happened that i that i happened to kind of have similar things i guess of the character in that sense and i once i was in costume they made my teeth look, you know, real dingy with the makeup. I grew out my eyebrows, which is like excruciating. <laughs> <laughs> the vanity in me, you know, I am an actress. But I remember, but I, you know, I let it happen. I was like, I'll let them grow. I don't care if guys start to be put off and they're like, oh, it's, that girl's looking kind of funny. <laughs> I'm in a movie that's going to be going places. So right. don't you worry how I'm looking. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I just let it, you know, if I'm going to play this character, I'm going to, go for it 100 percent. and i just put myself into the character once i was in the costume all black you know in that 80s garb and everything like it started just coming just flowing 
And that speech at the end was improvised by me too, where I'm talking about, I want to open up a clinic. I want to make my mom real proud. Lee was like, just talk about what Rita wants, like what, what she wants. And I said, okay. You know, cause when we were writing in those notebooks, like we were actually writing things as the character. Like we were actually writing because if there were things that Lee wanted us at the notice a moment's notice, yeah, do it. You know what I mean? Like there yeah. was no like two ways about it. You're either prepared or you're not. And I think that's why I um, am still doing what I do because you have to be disciplined. You have to be in it a hundred percent if this is what you want to do and you have to love it. And playing Rita uh, Romero was no, uh, was no laughing feat. It was, it was a, it was a tough role. I, like I said, I did the best I could. 21, you know, being in a feature film that none of us knew where it was going to go. You know, we didn't know the impact it was going to have, but I knew it was going to be impactful. I really did. I, I remember I tried telling the director and he was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> when we were in Utah, you know, because he was excited and everything. And I was just like, we're going to win, man. I got a feeling like we're going to win Sunday. <laughs> and I just, because there, it, it had been a while since there was a film like Precious that had come out. It was a while, you know what I mean? Before you really saw a real raw independent kind of film, you know? And I think that's why I just was a little confident, like we're going to win this. <laughs> Isn't it nice when a director lets you do some improvising like you did there at the very end? I mean, I know some don't do that. You have to be strict on there, but to let you put, you know, what you really think that character would say. Yeah, of course. That That's why Lee is like one of the, he's a great director for that. You know what I mean? When a director lets you kind of have a, an opinion or let you do your thing, you know, because what's like doing one take and if it doesn't work, you do another take. You know what I'm saying? It's not old school where it's like films and we're going to waste film if it doesn't work. <laughs> like, you right. know what I mean? Like you could reshoot it if it doesn't work or take both takes and then see if it works later. Uh, Michael Almoreto was like that too uh, for, in the film Margie Prime. He was a he was a nice director too, where he asked you like your opinion and what you thought, and nice. if you had any feedback or anything like that. I, I like directors like that, and I think it, you know it makes it all around great for the whole production. You know, not just for actors, but if your director is open to working that way, I think you'll get a you, you'll get a great project. You know what I mean? Like you'll get a great film or great and episode. Part of a team. I mean, you feel like you're in yeah. it together. Yeah, exactly. Michael knows. <laughs> you said, quote, hello, peace and blessings this week, y'all. Remember, you're doing the best you can with what you can. Regardless, you're moving mountains, so keep pushing, unquote. What do those awesome and inspiring words mean to you? They mean a lot, man. You know, there were times where I just, I, I, I think that's why I'm always so positive on my Instagram as best as I can be. I'm not perfect, but I try. And I just try to spread that because I know <laughs> there some days are better than others. You know what I mean? Like, and that's normal. That's life. And I, you know, not everyone knows this too, but like in the fall, uh, I fell off my, my bicycle because I'm an avid bike rider and my chain just gave out while I was biking. And I was up on my bike. I fell really bad. Like my almost fractured my elbow and everything. I'm not the type to, uh, you know, I don't post everything on my life 24 seven. Sure. <laughs> Cause you know, what I went through is what I went through. I didn't want anyone feeling like, Oh, poor seven, eight, you know, like, no, 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 no. I'm going to be fine. But it was a journey and I was operating with one side of my body. I had to have family help me, my mother, my brother, my sister, you know, it was pretty bad. And I was like, you know, life is not so bad. You know what I'm saying? Like everything is, as long as I'm here, God bless. But I just, I put more value to myself and to what I'm doing. And I said, Oh my God, like something really bad could have came out of that. But from that, I'm like, that's why I say peace and blessings y'all. Like, because I know anything can happen at the drop of a hat. You know what I mean? Like, and I guess if anything should happen to me, God forbid, but I want, at least those to be the words that people, you know what I mean? My last words, I guess, I God forbid. Right. but you know what I mean? Like, you know, and I just try to, because like I said, or maybe it's something about your business or about things you're trying to do in life and you're trying to get the job and you're trying to book the role or whatever it is, man. I know how discouraging it can get. There were things I've wanted and it didn't happen, but it was okay. 
you know what I mean? Like there's, it, it just happens in life. But I noticed when I, that thing didn't work out, this did, you know what I right. mean? Much better than I thought. And I'm like, oh right. yeah, that made more sense. You know what I mean? Nothing ever makes or breaks me uh, basically. And you know what I compare myself to? I'm going to tell you, you're probably going to think I'm weird, <laughs> but I, I compare myself to like uncle fester kind of energy <laughs> where like they try to kill him, but nothing can kill. Him. Like, you know, like nothing yeah. can get rid of him. <laughs> That's so funny. And I'm always, yeah. I'm weird like that. But I always think about when moments are like pretty, I'm like, it's okay. If uncle fester could have through it, I could do it. <laughs> it's putting that positive out into the universe. Cause it does come back to you. It does come back to you. I agree, man. It really does come back to you because like I said, I'm not perfect. I don't, I don't wake up like this. Okay. And, <laughs> and I don't go out there and, and my whole day is not a bed of roses or whatever, man. But sometimes I feel like with life, you have to go with the flow. You can't resist. You can't push. You can't, you know what I mean? You can't say, I want this. I want this so much. You have to be happy with what you have, where you are. You know, God bless that you're alive and breathing. And just go with the flow. It's like that um, that Bruce Lee quote that I've seen going around Instagram. He's like, become water, become water, my friend. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it's the truth. Like, it you have to adapt. Yeah, you have to adapt. You know what I mean? Like, just be happy where you are and what you're able to do. And we live, too, in a time, God bless, where it's like we have access to platforms where we're able to express ourselves and you know what I'm saying? So it's like, okay, well then let's take advantage of that. And if you can create something, just do it. It makes you feel good. It's just like my sewing. It's therapeutic. Absolutely. <laughs> and putting out the positive is so much more. I mean, there's so much negative out there already. You get so tired of reading about it. You're like, ah, oh, enough of that. Putting out the positive. And I think, I really do think people appreciate it so much more. Yeah. We just, we all went through a pandemic traumatic for all of us <laughs> like, you know you know what i mean everyone was already dealing with whatever traumas we had <laughs> it was like right. when this came in, it was like dang it just when i thought i was i was climbing that mountain pushing those mountains i thought i pushed it just came back an avalanche came down <laughs> but we got through and, it yeah hell, heck yeah god bless we did you know what i mean so that's what I, i'm saying man if we got through that and you got through it if you did god bless then just forge through, man, and just make what you want happen. And there's no excuses. There's really no excuses. I'm, I'm big on that. I hope whoever sees this, there's no excuse. <laughs> Speaking of no excuses, Orange is the New Black was, you know, an American comedy drama, you know, streaming television mm -hmm. series. It was on Netflix. You mentioned yes. a minute ago, you know, as of 2016, it was Netflix most watched as well as longest running series at the time. So many big stars were on that show over the seven seasons mm -hmm. it was on there. Um, Rosa Cisnero is known as Miss Rosa, was an inmate mm -hmm. at Litchfield Penitentiary, Penitentiary and was played by Barbara Rosenblatt. And then you mm -hmm. played young Miss Rosa that was seen in flashbacks in, in season two of the show. What was it uh, like for you to play that character? And, and what did you enjoy most about that role? Oh, man. That was amazing. It was it was a really cool moment. Like I said, I had auditioned already for a few roles on Orange. And I kept going and kept going. And I remember I, I did the Young Rosa audition. And they wanted someone that looked uh, like, I think in their 30s at the time, like late 30s they wanted. But when I played it, I was like 20 something, like 20, over 25, I think, or was, whatever I was there. And I remember like it was... It was like, did I do a good job? I didn't think I did a good job. And I was like, I don't know. And then finally, like, I think I had to wait like a week and a half or something to find out that I finally, that I, I booked it. And I was like, holy mackerel. And then I almost, I, I think I almost didn't get it because of my lips from what, from what they were telling me. My lips was almost like a, a breaker or, or something like that. Cause like, you know, the, she was already going through the, the big C, you know what I mean? Within her arc. Right. And they were concerned with, well, her lips are thin now with them, maybe because of the big C, maybe because, you know what I mean? Like, so eh, F it, it works. Like, <laughs> so like right. the girls go, she, she did something good, you know, and, and she kind of looks like uh, Barbara Rosenblatt with certain features. Let's do it, you know? So I, I did my thing, man. And it was, I went into it like as if it was a movie. I think that's what it really was. Cause yeah. I'm a big film. I love films. And um, I, I think I when I 
I was I, I didn't think of it like, oh, this is a TV show. I was like, we're doing a action movie right now. <laughs> and I'm robbing a bank and my my man is teaching me. I'm holding up a bank. Like, you know, it's pretty badass. And I think that that also sparked in me that I like to I'm I'm into action. You know what I mean? Like I'm into you know being nitty gritty if I have to be but I would like to have like a leading man with me so then that way you know we can I can I still need a man in my life like you know? right. <laughs> I don't want to be like just that chick that's like I can do it I'll save you I want to try to save you Michael but you might need to save me too you know what I'm saying like <laughs> right <laughs> but that was mad fun man like I remember too we filmed in Harlem one of the scenes which was cool because I grew up in Harlem as a kid so that was fun to go back there and then and actually be filming, uh, you know, a great show that also, you know what it was too, man. I don't, it, it wasn't, Orange wasn't even the, the big show as it was. Uh, you know what I mean? It was, again, something that I was just happy to be a part of. And then boom, you know what I mean? Like the show started blowing up, you know, getting popular on its own. And that's what it is. You just go in hoping to do your, the best you can, whether the project is good or not, whether, you know what I mean? You just... Yeah. I'm just playing this part. I'm hoping to deliver. Maybe some people like it. Maybe they don't. It's fine. But I did my best. And that's all you can hope for. And yeah, Orange you, was badass. You were in like season two. So you were early on the show before it actually really got big. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. When it started blowing up the way it did, it was kind of, it was like, I guess, right after season two, really. Yeah. Really. Like it, it was already creating some buzz in season one, but then I remember after season two, the season two, it, it was a really great episode. They did a great job. They did. Are you shopping for a new watch, an engagement ring, any kind of jewelry at all? What's up, Memphis? This is Jaron Jackson Jr. from the Grizzlies, encouraging you all to shop where I shop, Platinum Jewelers here in Memphis. Platinum Jewelers has a big selection of earrings, stockable rings, luxury watches, necklaces, bracelets, really whenever you need. 9387 Poplar next to Fresh Market in Germantown. So if you need anything jewelry related, go to my spot, Platinum Jewelers. Quote, Stephanie Andujar, who plays young Rosa, is mesmerizing, and I want her to star in the prequel, star in a prequel spinoff called Portrait of the Prisoner as a Young Bank Robber, unquote. That is a quote from Hilary uh, Busas, who at the time was with Entertainment Weekly, and mm -hmm. she's now a Vanity Fair senior Hollywood editor. You know, many times, you know, words about performances are not good from people in that end of the business. You know, how did it feel to hear <laughs> such high praises about your role at the time it was amazing it was really amazing like i said i i just felt so blessed i felt so blessed man everything i had been through everything you know what i mean like the decline from just being so young going through it you know all that stuff and then to be recognized it felt good you know what i mean like going from playing a pregnant prostitute you know god bless them out there too but playing that kind of role to now being considered for like an action kind of role and, and doing a great job that you got, you know, journalists out there that are admiring your work. And it felt great. I was just so excited. You have no idea. I was like, thank God it's a good review. Yes. Good reviews are always good. <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> you said, quote, thank you for letting me sing and speak my truth to the dreamers, board members and supporters. It means a lot to me to share that there is no excuse to achieving what you want in life, no matter your race, economic situation, or gender, everyone is human being. And if we can allow ourselves to work as a community, dreams will come true. Thank you again for making this New York City Latina's dreams come true, unquote. You, you spoke those words to the uh, Idaho Dream Scholars last April. Tell us about that group and, and what that meant to you to be able to talk to them. Yeah, I was really excited because I've, you know, I have a dream help pay for me to go to college. You know what I mean? Most of my college tuition was really provided because of I Have a Dream Foundation. They had promised our grade since like third grade that they were going to take care of us going from us being, uh, being raised out here in the projects in Chelsea. And then when I actually was invited to host the gala, it was a virtual gala, I was invited. And from there, the Idaho chapter saw it. And then they wanted me to go on out there and inspire their dream scholars. And I was like, oh, my goodness, we're going to Idaho. <laughs> New Yorkers, Boricuas in Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> and that was fun, man. Like, it, it was really exciting. And it just so happened, too, that the Sun Valley Film Festival happened to be happening at the same time, that same, uh, like, four days that we were there. 
And I was like, oh, okay, that that's pretty fun that, you know, I can partake in that, but I can also, you know, inspire these kids that there really are no excuses, you know, obviously going out to Idaho and, and probably being raised in Idaho, I think would be a lot different than being raised sure. as a city slicker like myself. Right. <laughs> Did, didn't you, know, you meet where, Woody Harrelson there too? I did. You know, it's so funny, man. I wanted to see him do a coffee talk on the Sunday, but me and my mom were leaving that morning. So I was like, mom, I won't get to see Woody He's doing a coffee talk. I wanted to see what he had to say, whatever, you know? And she's like, oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. So then we end up going to one of the after parties there that they were having the night before. And I was whooping it up. And then we're finally about to leave. And I'm making a beeline for the exit. I see Woody. And I went, Mom, Woody Harrelson. OMG. Like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so he was really cool, mad cool people. He was very embracing. You know what I mean? It looked like he, when he sees other actors coming up, I think it probably hits him like, I know what that feels like. You know what yeah. I mean? Being like, you know, the newbie kind of actor on the block coming in and doing your thing, trying to, you know, navigate this industry, you know what I'm saying? But he was mad cool and embraced. He was like, you're an actress. I was like, yes. He was like, come here. I was like, okay. Nice. <laughs> but he was mad cool and we got the picture and it was really funny how I, I kept telling my mom, dreams come true in Idaho. Like, <laughs> so funny I, I swear i think because all the pollution out here in new york or something like that yeah. just kind of like blocks or delays things a little bit <laughs> <laughs> but in idaho the air out there was amazing but Actually, i was really happy to inspire um you know the dream scholars too <laughs> and i'll tell you a real quick funny story i actually met him mm -hmm. he was filming the people versus larry flint back in 96 oh. here in memphis and he they had a ended up having a break a friend of mine was in the movie He's like, everybody's going over to the University of Memphis to the, play basketball. Like Woody, this is four years after he did White Man Can't Jump. Mm -hmm. But they said he really likes to play. And so they said, hey, you want you to come over? And my friend of mine said, come meet us out. There's a bunch of people. So I remember I got to the gym before they all did because they were finishing up on the set, had to change clothes. And he walked in with his little daughter at the time. She could have been but two or three on his shoulders. He was the first person to walk in the gym. I'm sitting there putting my shoes on. He just walks over to me like I'm this ordinary person. Hey, what's up, man? I'm Woody. Like, you know, and that you wasn't see? arrogant. What I mean, I got to play. Now, he wasn't as good as he was in White Men Can't Jump, but, he's, <laughs> but he could hoop. He could play basketball. All the editing, just, all the editing. <laughs> but I got to play with him and everything. It was just fun, but he was that just so, so cool. genuine you down see? the earth. Yeah, it was just you so see? cool. Yeah. Michael knows. You can use that as like a sound bite. Michael knows. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He was mad cool people. And that's like, you know, like you try to be as cool as you can be in this industry, you know what I mean? Like, especially amongst uh, actors and other colleagues or whatever have you. And, you know, it's not easy, man. Like, it's true. So, like they say, right, that that quote, don't meet your heroes sometimes because sometimes it can like, damn, like, you know, it really brings it back down to perspective and it can really like disorient you. But, <laughs> but that's why like, you've got to really try. Like, I think that's what it is. If, if I chose to be in this industry, I need to be able to deal with, the muck of what's in the industry, most likely, or, you know, in my business, in my field, you know, just yep. with producing and anything I do, if this is what I chose, I better be prepared for what can come or what's to come. But remember, it's always about the audience. It's always about the fans, man. Like I can't stress it enough. I think because I grew up watching other artists and they always bigged up the fans because it's the truth when you, the fans make you, Right. You know what I mean? Like when, when Young Rosa happens because the fans liked it. I did I, I, I did my best, but the fans okayed it and they verified and they said, yes, she did a great job. And some of them started drawing things and everything like that. And I went, your fans are the ones I'm performing for. It, it's, you know, the corporations and everything like they do a great job of because we need them too. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I just feel like sometimes, you know, sometimes you get the whole, oh, the, the corporations... We need them too, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, we need to be able to work together. And I think they try their best to give us artists, you know, good enough platforms. And it's up to you on what you do with it. And I just think if there could be a good medium between it and you give us artists a little a little leeway, you know, right. <laughs> that could be nice. I feel like I said too much. No, you didn't. <laughs> Speaking of what you do with something, speaking of what you do with it, you know, Marjorie Prime, uh, 2017, Science fiction drama takes place, you know, around the year 2050. And 
stars John Hamm, who obviously is big, but he's even bigger now after Top Gun Maverick, which is humongous. Mm-hmm. Tim Robbins, Gina Davis, Lois Smith, and also stars Stephanie Andujar's Julie. You play the role of Marjorie's caretaker in the film. You end up moving in with the family to help watch over her because she's, you know, 85, starting to show signs of Alzheimer's. And once again, you're working with some of the biggest names in Hollywood here. Tell us a little bit more about that movie uh, and your character. And, and, you know, what if anything, what did you learn about yourself, you know, from playing that role? Oh, man. That was really cool, too. Uh, it was funny because when I went in for the audition, I remember the director was like, I liked you because you smiled and it's a hologram. And I went, oh, that's right. It is a hologram. <laughs> you know, I think I didn't. I just went on instinct. You know what I mean? So I was like, OK. And then when I started really getting into the material, I was like, oh, this is pretty good. Like, I, I liked it. You know what I mean? I, I think there were a bit of uh, different uh, ending revisions as it went on the film. But I, Julie didn't really even, she existed in the play that it was based off of, but she wasn't in the play. Right. She was only referenced. So Michael Morita actually wanted to give, you know, a heartbeat to Julie. And it was like, oh, okay, cool. Like, you know, I'm happy you chose me. This is nice. And I remember really crying too in the scene with John Hamm. Like I was really crying. I think even I impressed the director and them like, oh, okay, so we, we hired the right girl. <laughs> and I remember it was like a roller coaster. I was like bawling. And they were like, okay, now pull it back. I was like, okay, go pull it back. No, I'll give a little more. Okay, give a little more. Like, <laughs> and it was not easy. I felt really drained after that. Because I'm usually, like I said, I, I'm a very athletic person and I exercise and, you know, I'm, 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 it makes me happy. And when those moments hit the where I have to go in, into a different spectrum of being a little dark, it can it really takes a lot of energy out of me. I think that's why I realize I'm an empath. Like, <laughs> because I notice when I give too much, my energy can get like, like I get really depleted uh, uh, mentally when I give what I give. And it was cool, too, to be able to work with, you know, Tim Robbins, Gina Davis, Lois Smith, John Hamm, you know, a Puerto Rican girl coming from New York City. You know what I mean? From where yeah. I came from. That was a, it was an honor. You know, you meet them and you watch them all your life growing up. And I remember my sister, we went to the after party and she tells Gina Davis, I, you know, we used to watch Quick Change on VHS, like back to back because we didn't have cable. Oh, I love that movie. <laughs> you know? I forgot all about that movie. Yeah, that was a I great movie. That. that was a great film. Yeah. And she told her that's true. We watched that because we, you know, we had to watch VHS as if we didn't have cable on. So <laughs> we had to put them on. And she told her that. And, and, and you know, she was really kind of like, oh, OK, like that, that's what's up, I, you know. But it's true, you know, you don't think you're going to, you know, you never think you're going to work with these people. You don't think that these are going to be your colleagues one day. You know, right. you're just feeling lucky enough to get a bit part anywhere you can in this business, you know. And it was really exciting. I really awesome. felt like at least Michael, you know, gave uh, a moment for me and put in a Julie, you know, because he didn't have to. And that was nice of him to do that. Absolutely. But I think, like I said, it was really it was emotionally draining. Like there were good moments, but then there were moments where it was really emotionally draining because, you know, you're dealing with such a subject of a hologram replacing a human being. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Like it, it's a film, but yet it's like it, it's going to be so real, you know, like eventually one day that will be real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and look at all the stuff with artificial intelligence coming out now. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's scary. already there. Most likely, they yeah. just they just are waiting for the day to say, okay, now everybody can have it in their home. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> you said, "quote I love life. Patience is making me a winner. I really believe that. Have a beautiful day, y'all." Unquote. <laughs> you know, there's that New Yorker saying, "Y'all again." You know, patience sometimes is extremely difficult. You know, as we all know. You know, how have you been able to you know, keep patient during difficult and sometimes stressful times in your life? Yeah, it's not easy. Uh, the only thing, like I like I said, for me, I exercise. I, I'm, I'm a dancer. I dance a lot. I'm very, very athletic. And I parlay that into feeling like if I'm doing athletic uh, ability exercising, then I'm an athlete and I have, you know, in my field. And you have to have patience 
to be able to do what you do. You know what I mean? Like you just have to, it's all about timing. It's like, when it's your time, it's your time. So while it's your time, you're incubating, you're, you're learning, you know, you're, you're figuring out how you're going to approach things, you know? So you want to be prepared. You want to be prepped. You know, my, my vocal coach always tells me you want to be ready to do the surgery, you know, (laughs) in anything that you do. And it's the truth. But while you're waiting, instead of pushing and pushing, oh, I just want it, I want it, I want it. Don't worry about getting to the top of the mountain. You know what I mean? Because once you get up there, then the feeling's over. You know what I mean? Like, just worry about the journey. Even when there were times, I remember where, like, it would be slow auditioning or whatever have you. I'd be like, but I love doing that. Or no, actually, when I was already booking a lot of work, I would be like, damn, but I'm missing, like, the grind of, like, going on those little auditions. Or, like, <laughs> because it's in those moments where you really have to pay attention just be in the moment because those are the moments you're gonna miss you know what I mean like you're gonna be like oh it's not like even just like you right when you started your podcast and when you started your business I bet it was probably like slow going at first or whatever it was for you in your journey but now finally you're at a place where it's like oh I remember what it was to be back there like now I'm happy to be here but you still miss probably when you were just putting it together because you'll think back like oh snap like I remember like those times when I was kind of like going through it, but you know, you get, you're just grateful for where you are now, but you patience do. is key, man. Like you need patience in anything you do, anything you do. You know, you've had so many great parts and roles in TV and film, but where you got my attention, it was in 2018 on my favorite television show, Blue Bloods, where you oh. played uh, the character Amale Chavez. Uh, yeah. The episode that you were in, in in season eight was called Your Six. It, it showed a couple of great things to me. Uh, one was that you and uh, had really good on-air chemistry back and forth with Donnie Wahlberg, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, who of course plays Danny Reagan on the show. Mm-hmm. Secondly, you're really fast. Uh, I mean, I know it's TV and everything, but watching you run around the streets in New York, you were pretty darn fast. It was pretty funny. Uh-huh. Um, okay. Tell us a little bit about how that role came about and what you enjoy most about it and, and how it ended up obviously end up becoming a recurring role later on, which we'll talk about too. Yeah, Molly, Molly Chavez was actually supposed to be Molly Fitzgerald, which was cool. It was fine. And then they changed it, I guess, when they picked me up. Brian, I believe Brian Burns was in the casting and the director for the for that episode. And I did a great job. Even I I, I felt it too. I was kind of like, I know I'm doing a good job. Like, you know, an actor just knows when an audition sure. is in the pocket, you know, <laughs> that's what we say. And you just have that feeling. But I still wasn't sure. And then I found out the same day that they that they liked me. They wanted to book me for Molly Chavez, which was cool. And then Molly Chavez, too, was supposed to get shot up at the end of the first episode with her boyfriend, who gets uh, Malbatten, who gets shot up. And I was supposed to go through that. And honestly, I was dreading to put on those squibs. I really, I really didn't want to go through that. But I was like, if I got to do it, I got to do it. And I think I just start, you know, I made, I think it was the choices I made for Molly Chavez. You know, I kind of was inspired by uh, Heath Ledger's Joker. Al Pacino's, uh, you know, Scarface, you know what I mean? Like I was, I was Tony Montana, you know, I was, I was, I plucked kind of inspiration from them because I'm a bomb expert and I'm, I'm, I'm a psychopath, you know, right. <laughs> I'm Bonnie and Clyde with my man, I will kill you at the drop of the hat. Uh, so <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, okay, so start thinking, you know, start putting yourself like, let's get some inspiration going. Let's, let's see, you know, cause if you're playing that kind of character, you, you don't have you don't give no f's you know what i mean you have no f's to give so you're kind of living at i have nothing to lose kind of mentality and i think it was the choices i made i I made molly on some like listen i know what i'm doing is wrong but i'm doing it for the right reasons i was doing it for my mom you know what i mean in the episode like you know she's doing it for someone she loves isn't it's kind of like why villains or superheroes you know we always got a motive and it's usually for something we love, either selfishly or some someone else. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, like I said, I think it was just the choices I made, especially when I smiled in the interrogation room. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. just smiled because I that knew so. Out. Like you, yeah. I was like, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get my number. You know, like you're yeah. not gonna know who I am. Like, <laughs> right. I was thinking that in the back of my mind. Right. But yeah, and I think too, because you know, Donnie, Donnie grew up 
kind of in the hood too. You know what I'm saying? Uh, his Boston uh, Dorchester story too. And I think that's why our, our personalities vibe. You know what I mean? I think we both kind of have that attitude of, you know, I'm an alpha female, he's an alpha male kind of thing going on. And I think it was kind of cool too to see him interacting with, we know he shouldn't be kind of interacting with an informant and kind of getting this relationship, but that's what's exciting because we don't see that in right. real life. You know what I right. mean? Like you don't yeah. hear about that stuff and it's always frowned upon. So I think too, that's what kind of made it all the more delicious. You know what I'm saying? Like- <laughs> yeah. That was a great scene. That that scene in in where in the you're in the interrogation room, the box. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. was a great scene mm-hmm. with it for sure. And you obviously okay. impressed them a lot on the set because they brought you back several months later in season nine for yeah, episode did. handcuffs. You know, yeah. you had off scene, obviously off screen had gone to jail for nine months the first time. And after you get out, you know, Molly ends up returning to Danny's precinct, ask him to help her out with her, you know, 16 year old <laughs> brother who's getting tied up in a gang. And if I remember correctly, you know, Danny, uh, he made a comment to you the first time saying something, the fact that he doesn't help out people that try to kill him <laughs> and that your <laughs> and your charms, obviously they must've worked, you know, because he ends up helping you out. Um, mm-hmm. you referred to Danny as your cop crush because your brother mm-hmm. ratted you out and told him that, um, yeah. as I mentioned before, great <laughs> chemistry between the two of the characters at the end of the episode, he ends up helping your brother out. And mm-hmm. I remember you guys were just sitting in the car and you hit on him. And when he doesn't respond, you, he, uh, you said to him too soon. And he answers, yeah, maybe. Um, what was it for you to go back and do that second episode of blue bloods? And, you know, since obviously you worked a lot with, uh, with Donnie, you know, your scenes with him, you know, tell us a little bit more, more what you learned from him. <sighs> what I learned from him. I think what it was is that obviously the, you know, I think he's loyal to the Blue Bloods fans, obviously. He's very loyal to his fans. And I think he, too, was probably like, let's make sure we do this the right way. You know, you don't want to get the fans upset either with, you know, they were attached to his first, to his wife that was on the show. Right. And they're, you know, the, the fans get loyal and you like I that's why like I said earlier it's about the fans right because you want to make sure like you tread those waters carefully like how do you bring in now a new love interest if this is where we're going and how do we introduce her in the right way and do we want Danny the cop getting involved with an informant there's big questions you know what I mean and I think as much as the chemistry was great and as much as that seemed good I think it has to be taken care of in the right way for the fans. And I think that's what Donnie showed me too, is just like, be, you know, authenticity. You know what I mean? Like that, I think that that's Donnie liked that too, that I had this authenticity to what I was bringing to the character and Donnie couldn't, and I could relate to that. I think, like I said, because we both come from, we came from nothing. And I think that that's why we both can relate to each other. You know, I, I'm this actress working with him, but, I'm not coming with a silver spoon in my mouth. You know, I didn't go to an Ivy League. I didn't go to, you know, Juilliard. You know what I mean? Right, right. <laughs> I respect those places. But you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't come from that kind of background. And I think, like I said, I think that's why we vibed. And Donnie was just letting me kind of take, you know, take the lead on my character. He wasn't like, you know, saying, well, you should do this, that, you should do that. Like, no, he was kind of like just open. And I think he just liked my choices too. And he was making good choices. And when you work with someone that knows what they're doing, it makes the job all the more better. You know what I mean? When you're working with professionals, you feel good. You know, like you, it's like ping pong. Right. The ball's just going back and forth, back and forth, you know? Right. So who knows what's to come from it? I mean, there are fans till this day saying, when you gonna come back? When you gonna come back? Listen, I've had my reps reach out I've had the fans reach out. <laughs> I don't know what they're planning, what they want to do. The only thing I wish, if anyone sees this or hears this, just do it for the fans. Right. The fans want Molly Chavez back. Bring her back. You know what I'm saying? If y'all can, fit in then somewhere there. <laughs> right. But do it for the fans. This is what they want. They want to see, you know, whether they 
put those characters together or not, whether that works, we don't know. You know, it's not just like, oh, put them together right away. It doesn't have to be that way. It could work in numerous ways. But you just could be an informant for, for them. That's what I'm saying. You know yeah. what I mean? And and like I said, I'm happy to be doing what I'm doing on my end. Sure. I'm creating. I'm producing. You've seen it on my Instagram. I'm there doing something for my fans every day, putting something out, you know, almost every day or whatever it is. And I'm just being creative and expressive and being the artist that I am. And while I am, you know, like I said, if Blue Bloods is it's thinking about bringing Molly Chavez back, then that would be great. Only just for the fans, you know, if, so the fans can at least enjoy it, you know, Absolutely. and they'll stick around. Absolutely. <laughs> And the Har Product Productions, you know, how, how did your family come up about, you know, with the web comedy series, a Steph A, a one woman show? I understand mm-hmm. it's based on your life growing up. Yeah. Um, like I said, I've watched many of the YouTube clips and you're so talented. It's not easy to do that at all. I mean, there's no way. I mean, the, what you do, that's hard. And tell the audience, you know, a little bit about the show and, you know, cause it's a yeah. completely different side of, of you from, you know, what people are used to seeing on TV and, and in the movies. Yeah, Steph, a one woman show. I play like 10 plus different characters. Yeah. My sister said, make a one woman show. And I was thinking about putting it on the stage at first. But then that's when I said, no, you know what? Make some episodes, actually. It'll be easier. I could put it on YouTube. <laughs> Thought it would be easier. Just as more work, but it's right. okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I right. actually got really good at editing. And then started just playing different characters. It started with like, if I got a wig, I just put a wig on. You know what I mean? And then just like think of whatever character I could. And when I got long black hair, I was like, I would be French and I would be Nepois and I would come in to, uh, to this uh, new uh, apartment and I will go model. You know, that was it. That was like, okay, that's a character. And then, you know, then if I wore like a some kind of a do-rag, not, now I'm going to be, yo, what's up? I'm the OG on the block. You know what I'm saying? I'm Bonnie Day Day. Like, and it was just kind of based off of kind of characters that I grew up with too around around the hood. You know what I mean? So right. I just started playing them and I wanted people to see the comedic side of me. And I had just it's there. Kind of, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> I thank you. Cause I was already doing dramas before that. You know, I was already kind of, you know, precious, orange and the black. You know, I was doing all these dramatic roles, which is fantastic. But I was like, you know what? I just left my, you know what? My phone is going to die. Oh my goodness. Can you hold on one sure, second? Sure, you're good. Take one your time. Second. Let me get my charger. Yeah. Just got a few more minutes left. Okay, good. Okay. Whew, there we go. Okay. There we go. So anyway, so then that's when I started working on episodes and then slowly but surely, every year, I kept like including another character and then another character and another one. Another one. <laughs> and it just felt good because I got out of like an agent manager relationship at that time. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to just create. I'm going to. I thought about Anduhar. And then I said, production company. I said, why don't I just make Anduhar Productions? Like It flows real well together, that name, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? So that's yeah. what's up. And it was also kind of an ode to my father. Yeah. You know what I mean? I kind of wanted to make him proud because of him. He put me and my sister onto films at such a young age. He would be like, watch the films, but don't say the curse words. Okay. And we're like, okay. Like, you know, as long as we didn't do that, you know, we were already watching films that were like, you know, kind of like real cool films, like what is the Godfather or, uh, you know, all those films or whatever have you It kind of shaped my uh, career I would say it kind of shaped my mind I guess kind of you know how I approach roles or anything like that and then that's when our production just came about and I said all right I'm going to make my one woman show and I always wanted to also sing and become like this kind of pop artist as well like you know I like to do it all like sing act dance and I was like I'm going to make some music I'm going to make music videos and let's just do it I have Thank God we're, like I said, we're in an era right now where we have the means to perform. We have the means, we have access right now to put ourselves out there with whatever we want to create. So right. it's like, there's no excuse, just do it. Grab a phone, put out whatever you want to put out. It, and it's also about how it makes you feel good. You know what I mean? Like that, yeah. that you need a creative, expressive outlet, you know, or else you're just going to go nuts, you know, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of things that are stress relievers, quote, Happy birthday at Tripa Tisa Tika. 
Kupatika, yeah. Kupatika, eight years old and still looking like a puppy. Love you, my baby. Way by laughing my ass off. She did good only to pose once and she gave me a smile. Love you, Tika Wika. Tell us about your doggy. <laughs> Tika Wika, Tripatika. I actually named her after a uh, lead character I played um, when I was in Talent Unlimited. And I was the title character that my drama teacher, he made a play called Tripatika. It was kind of like uh, the Wizard of Oz, but like on acid kind of thing, I guess you could say. <laughs> it's like a delicate kind of play. And then many, many moons later, I guess, and I got Chipatika in uh, 2015. And then that's when I said, I'm going to name her something different. I'm not going to pick, you know, the princess or like, you know, the generic dog name. So I was like, that's a good name. And, and she happens to have the same color hair as me and everything, which is kind of cool. She's somewhere around here. She's over there on the sofa. I'm not going to go grab her. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've had her now eight years and she's my little, she's my little, my little, my little thing. She's mad cute, but she could be feisty. She's a little antisocial, which is not good. I never really put her in those dog runs like that because she's so tiny. Right. No, I get that. <laughs> I don't do I, yeah, I show a lot so of pictures tiny. of my dogs. I have three miniature schnauzers. So I show a lot of pictures of them and I always act like they're sort of making fun of me and sort of, you know, because <laughs> not to take myself too seriously. But yeah, they're my kids. I love them. Yeah, I see. Yeah, absolutely. I love, I love yeah, I love Chippy because she's, yeah, man, she's cool. Like she's like having a child, you know, it's like, yeah. it's, it's, it's uh preparing me if in the future if ever one day i should have kids so at least it's practice <laughs> yes good practice for you for sure and i understand you have an older sister melanie and your brother uh hector jr tell us a little bit about that yeah. yeah my sister she's two years older than me she was born in 84 and she's a graphic designer she's very influential in my career like me and her we're besties we're best we're, we're you know we're best friends really and just like an older sister, she could be annoying too, but, but I love her. And like I said, she's, she's the reason why I made step on one woman show. She, she really was, you know, she kind of gave me the ideas and I just ran with it. So she was amazing for that. And, and she's been drawing too since she was like five. So she's a graphic drawing artist. And then my younger brother is also an artist too. They went to art and design high school here in New York city. So he is 10 years younger than me, my brother. We look almost just alike, you know, <laughs> and he's a great photographer, too, because he's taken a lot of my headshots and he has great ideas, too. I like he's another kind of artistic director. I have you know, my sister nice. and him are kind of like artistic directors within our productions. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so that's pretty dope. But both of them are really, you know, and then I'm the middle child. So, you know, I'm the one that couldn't sit still, I guess. So I'm the one whose instrument is this right. so <laughs> yes. it's got to work with what i got i got but um yeah so they they really make up uh Andohar productions and my mom too she makes all the great food because she has that nevia carmelas i'm giving her a plug to her instagram and <laughs> it's basically a page of all her food that she makes i call her crafties like when we when we have um uh projects that we work on like on the right. set i'm like mom you're crafties like that's you know the craft services that sets up the food <laughs> So she makes sure the food is there and she takes pictures of me as well. I think a lot of people see my, my sexy photos and they're always like, who takes those photos? Sometimes trivia. Now I'm going to tell you, I take them a majority of the time. They're self portraits. My mother takes them and sometimes my brother. Very and, cool. and there you go. You know what I mean? Like, cause I know people are like, who takes those pictures? Oh my God. Like, you know, she's in these positions. What's going on? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Pause, Speak, we're not talking about those kids. Speaking of mom, <laughs> you said, quote, happy birthday, mom. I love you so much, mother. You're the best and strongest woman I know. Thank you for always being supportive and cool at the same time. I see where I get my rhythm. Love you lots, mom. Let's get, uh, as I say, Liddy Witty. You guys were Liddy dancing. <laughs> Y'all were dancing together. That was so cool. Yeah, it was her birthday. And I told her, I was like, mom, because she's always telling me like, oh, put yourself on TikTok. Let's do like TikTok. And I'm like, mm -hmm. and so don't get me started with the TikTok. So I was like, you know, what, mom, we'll do a dance. and We'll do just like TikTok. And she goes, OK, it took her like an hour to learn just this. <laughs> it was kind of a right. process because, you know, she's not a dancer, dancer like me like that. But she gets down. You know what I'm saying? Like, I kind of got my rhythm from her, obviously. But it took her a minute and she goes, this is what all the hoopla is. I don't know how they put those videos on TikTok so fast, you know, because she thinks it's just like that, you know, sure. <laughs> they make it look like that, but it can take you a while to learn some dance moves. 
So it's so funny when we did it, but I want, you know, I like to show people too that my mom still got it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? For being uh, 64, God bless. You know what I'm saying? So she's doing the thing and she's holding it down. So Last- God bless. <laughs> Absolutely. Last person I want to talk about is your dad, Hector. You said, quote, happy birthday, pops. Love you and miss you a lot. Would have been 62 today. This is back on February 11th of 2022. God bless always, pops. It was a picture of us at the pool on 125th Street in Amsterdam uh, from the Anders- Andujar Production Archives. Tell us just a little bit more about your dad. Oh, man, my dad, you know, he was he was the OG he was an OG. He was, um, you know, he kind of could hold down any kind of job. But my dad didn't have, you know, my dad was born in Ponce, Puerto Rico, like I said. And he came here with his mother, my abuela Nivia, who I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm wearing her blouse, as you can see. Like, that's what's funny that you brought this up now, too. And I mean, it's cool. And they, she came here and raised him by herself. And my dad went through a lot. Uh, being raised out here too with her and then he met my mother when they were like 16 15 16 years old so they had like that real uh, junior high school sweetheart love and yet you know they had a tumultuous relationship too it was far from perfect but they loved each other and they had me and my siblings but my father was kind of like a loner too you know like you know we were his family you know and when my mom would go work when we were young, my, my dad would be there taking care of us. You know what I mean? Just me and my sister before my brother came. And he was a tough guy. Like, he just was not one you wanted to mess with at all. And he was funny and everything. But like I said, he meant business. Because, you know, my father could hustle. And he was a street pharmacist. And he was an OG, man. Like, he was not one to mess with. And I just... I think that's why, too, like, I'm an actress because my father was very good. At, like, he was very good at, like, I don't want to say, like, yeah, he was, he was good. At, like, I don't want to say getting over on people, but you know what I mean. Like, you I know, know he was just mean. good at, yeah. He's a like, talker. he had that kind of, yeah, like, I remember, actually, he took me and my sister to see uh, Donnie Brasco when it came out in theaters. And he would take me and my sister, and I, I forgot how old I was, I I could have been maybe 10, nine or 10. I don't remember. I think about 10 or something like that. And I was like, okay, we'll go see this film. And I remember watching halfway through and I'm like, what is this? What are we watching? You know, 10 year old girl, what do I know? But I just knew it was another gangster film. He loved gangster gangster movies, you know what I'm saying? And he would be like, girls, I'll be right back. Okay, dad, go handle business. We watch this, the movie, and he'll come back. You know, <laughs> it was like when well, you could do that in movie theaters, you know? That's funny. And yeah, like that was, that, that was his thing. But I think that's why me and my sister grew up loving these kinds of films. And I think that's why I love being a film actress as well, because I grew up on it. You know what I mean? So when you grow up on something, it's just kind of, it's going to stay in you some way, somehow. And it's going to kind of become, you become the person you are because of those things. But my father, I, I thank him for introducing me to films, you know what I mean? And for giving me my strength, because that that's, I think, why I'm the alpha female that I am, kind of. <laughs> I'm delicate, too, you know? <laughs> right. I'm gentle, too. But you know what I mean? I'm a strong girl. I was just thinking that, too, earlier. I was just kind of like, you know, I have, a strong, I have a strong character because of everything I've been through in my life. And it, being that my father's not here, he passed away from colon cancer in 2009. And it was right, he didn't get to see the film Crushes. And he kind of was helping me through that, you know, when he knew I got the part and everything, he was trying to give me, you know, advice. And then not even less than a year later, he's gone. You know what I mean? So it was kind of like, wow. And it was really unexpected. And I miss him so much dearly. But because of him, I also created Andor Productions. So that's why I guess certain things have to happen in your life uh, yeah. in weird ways. Um he saw but it I though. Think... You, you know, he saw it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I mean, course. energy, our inner, our loved one's energy and spirit is always around us. He saw that film. Yeah, I know. You're right, man. I, like I said, just the fact that you brought him up and I'm wearing my abuela's blouse. No, co- yeah. I don't believe in coincidences <laughs> at all. I don't believe there are no coincidences. That's what I'm saying. So I know yep. that they're here in spirit Absolutely. with us right now. And especially, you know what I'm saying? Like you, this was really cool of you to to ask me to come on to your show and to ask me these questions. It's been a while. It's been nice. You know what I mean? Like it's nice to get 
the, you sense. know, to remind people of, you know, the journey that I have had in my career and where I'm at now. And, and it's all good. I'm going with the flow, Michael. I'm going with the flow. <laughs> I have just one more last question for you. Yeah, it's okay. What are the most important lessons that you feel that you've learned in your life? If you had to name a few. Important lessons I've learned in my life. Oh, man. Um, not to take things too seriously. Not to take things too seriously. Uh, I'm, I'm still realizing that. Like, I'm only 36, God bless, even though I don't look it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still learning. Uh, just go with, like I said, go with the flow. You don't got to take everything so seriously. If you do, you won't enjoy the life that you do have or the, the, the moments that pass by. Or, And I would think, too, I, even after the pandemic, the, the thing I'm most grateful for is that I'm alive and I'm here and I'm able to still create and I'm able to still perform. I'm, that's what I'm taking from that. I've, I'm learning that you just have to appreciate where you are, what you're doing. Don't worry about what this one's doing. Don't worry about who's in what lane. Or stay in your lane. Stay focused and just enjoy it. Don't let anything else kind of like influence you to kind of berate yourself. You know, you're going to have those moments, but if you just persevere out through it, you'll be fine, man. Just go with the flow. That, that's what I'm learning is just go with the flow. That, that's the biggest lesson. And there's no excuses. Make Great it lessons. happen. <laughs> How can people find you and follow you and your career on social media? Yes. Um, they can go, well, Stephanie Andujar. So they can either Google me or go to my website, stephanieandujar.com or Stephanie at Stephanie <laughs> underscore Andujar underscore. I put really emphasis on the at. <laughs> right. But um, yeah, they can go there. I would just say go to stephanieandujar.com. Uh, basically, like if you don't have any of those social media apps, just go there and then you can direct yourself on whether you want to see my photos, what you want to see I'm up to or something like that. Or if you want to get to my social media, then there you awesome. go. <laughs> As I mentioned, you know, you, you first came to my attention, you know, watching you at Blue Bloods the first time. And I never expected you to come back for that second episode and your talent and personality. They just came shining through, you know, in both episodes and, you know, playing um, a bad person because you were a bad person, but you were funny. And then you were brought back, you know, as a sister trying to protect your brother, which to me means you're brought back sort of like an angel. Uh, you've already accomplished so much. You're just in your mid thirties and I expect you to have a long career in this business if that's what you choose to do. So I really From appreciate your mouth to today. God's ears, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Michael. This My pleasure. Really I'd like to also it. make sure I thank our sponsor, uh, Platinum Jewelers, once again. I, I know your time is uh, very, very busy and crazy. So once again, thanks so much for coming on. And I'd love to have you on again down the road again once you, you know, have more stuff going That'd on we can awesome. talk about. I'll make sure my Andor team knows, like, prioritize Michael Zellner. He was very nice. So if you come through, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? If there's more kind of interviews that, that get crazy, I'll be like, I remember Michael. So, so that's okay. <laughs> I appreciate that so much. Thanks again for coming on today. Oh, you're welcome. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye. <laughs>